you would open your Bibles to James chapter 3. We'll begin there this morning. We pretty much wrapped up chapter 2. I don't know that we need to go back and touch on anything. We really got the points, I think, covered. So we'll start with chapter 3 this morning. Begin our class with a prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we're thankful for another beautiful day that you've blessed us with. We're thankful, Father, for all blessings that you give us in life, but especially we're mindful of the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. The forgiveness of sins, the encouragement we receive through the scriptures, the promises that are made to us about our eternal salvation, and the blessings that we know that will come to us for living in accordance with thy will. We pray, Father, this morning that as we gather to study that we'll understand those things that will help us to be more mindful of our, our actions and how we conduct ourselves. We pray, Father, that we'll be the examples that we need to be in the world in which we live in. We're thankful this morning we have the opportunity to worship, and we pray that as we enter into that worship service that we'll, we'll, we will have prepared ourselves that we can worship in a manner that brings honor and glory to thy name and praise and all those things that are due unto you because of your greatness and for what you've done for us and for receiving our thanks for the things that we have received through your Son. We pray, Father, you help us to worship in a manner that will be pleasing unto you and we'll be able to edify one another. We pray, Father, for those who are sick. We have many on our sick list and many that we're aware of. We pray that you'll bless them with the factual attention that they receive through their doctors or medication or whatever means are being used to bring their health back. We pray that you'll bless these means and help them to be back with us and afford too much time. We pray, Father, that you be with those who've lost loved ones, that you continue to comfort them and, and again, help us to be a source of comfort to them as we uh, live among them uh, in, in the days ahead. We pray, Father, you bless us as we live in this difficult world, that we'll be reminded of this world is not our home and that we need to uh, conduct ourselves in a manner that's in line with the teachings of thy word and that will cause us to be able to receive as good and faithful servants. Continue with us, Father, through this day and through our lives. Bless us and keep us. We pray that uh, one day, heaven, you'll save us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We have this discussion quite often, but I keep having to bring it up because I think we just lose sight of some things if we don't at least uh, touch on it. Once again, we're going into chapter 3. Your mindset is, okay, let's just reset. Let's go ahead and start thinking about a totally different topic. And, you know, James is sort of rambling all over the place here. We don't know one minute he's talking about this, next minute something else. And so chapter 3... You know, race your minds from what was in chapter 2 or chapter 1 and then just, you know, expect something totally different. And so if you pick it up and start reading about the tongue, it's like, okay, we've shifted gears here. We're talking about something totally different. Well, I want to try to tie in this morning a little bit of what James has taught us so far and to show that we're transitioning here with a, basically the same kind of thought in mind that we've already been discussing. So there is continuity in what he's writing. And, and that's what I hope you'll see from, from our discussion this morning as we get into it. If you remember back in um, chapter 1, at, and uh, I, I guarantee you I have not talked to Tim or Lonnie. They keep getting into James chapter stuff, and, and we have not talked about that. So you've heard it several times, but 
uh, you know, it just happens that way. Um, you remember in chapter 1 we talked about, um, it was just talked here, I think maybe even Wednesday, I don't know, it's been recent. Um, the idea of looking in, uh, yeah, Steve did it too. I mean, everybody's trying to get James. Um, but you see where he's talked about, uh, we've talked about this for several weeks now, everybody talking about it. What happens to the man who is not a doer of the word? He looks into the mirror of the word of God, and it, it's, it's like him to that, it, at least James says. It's like him looking into the mirror, and then he goes away and forgets what manner of man he was, Right? What did I look like in the mirror? Well, I don't really remember, you know. And uh, you, you think about that sometimes. Maybe you uh, can relate to that, looking in the mirror in the morning, and you've got to get off to work, and you just sort of quickly see if everything's in place. If someone were to ask you something about your, your appearance, you'd say, I don't know, I have to go look in the mirror, you know, because you don't remember those things. But what, what did he equate that to? It's like a man looking at himself in the mirror, going away and forget what kind of man he was. What is he like in that? What's that compared to? A man who does what? Who hears the word, but doesn't do it. And so chapter 1, we talk about several things there. Um, we, but, but that's one thing I want to point out, is that he hears the word, but then he doesn't do it. There's no actions. Now, what did we get into chapter 2? What are we talking about there? We were talking about faith, but what was the problem with the faith that apparently they had? They were showing partiality, but and they were they they didn't they didn't understand that they were uh, they were guilty of the whole law by doing something that was to them probably insignificant. Someone comes into the building and we we look at them. We say, well. Maybe they need to sit over here, or, or oh, you're pretty prominent. Let's set you in a, a prominent place. And so he goes on to talk about that, and he says, if you don't recognize that, that is that is the uh, the evidence or the demonstration of your faith, how you believe, and that's what we do. If we do certain things, uh, and we're motivated motivated by certain things, that's demonstrating what we really believe. We don't typically, um, unless we're in some kind of weird situation and we're trying to uh, accomplish something and we're afraid we're not going to get it accomplished unless we act a certain way, typically when we do things, those things are based upon what? What you believe in. You're not going to go in here and say, I don't believe at all in this, but I'm going to go over here and support it. You know, we don't do things like that. Our actions are, are what demonstrates what we believe in. And so the, the idea here that he talks about in chapter 2 is that, you know, you, you may not realize it, but when you actually take someone and you put them in a place, you're demonstrating what you think inside. You're demonstrating how you feel about things. And you may not recognize that, but when you do that and you offend that person, you violate the law. And so he goes on to talk about faith, and most of the time when we talked about the faith, they apparently had faith that was the kind of faith that said, I've got faith. I've got faith. Let me tell you about my faith. And what we saw in the evidence of Abraham and Rahab and some of the other things that we talked about last week were the, the, the contrast between someone who says that they have faith and someone who actually demonstrated that their faith was genuine by what they did. And I hope you see the distinction there. So the, the idea is, I can't go around talking about my faith and it be real faith. I'm, I'm not saying that we can't talk about uh, how we feel and our beliefs in, in Jesus and God. Uh, there's nothing wrong with talking about those things. But there is something wrong with talking about those things and not demonstrating those things in our lives. Because if we don't demonstrate them in our lives, we don't really believe them. You know what I'm saying? We just... We don't believe them. We don't, we don't do enough. There's not, they don't move us enough to do anything. 
And so we saw examples of Abraham and Rahab and how Abraham was justified because he carried through with the sacrifice on his, on his son. He demonstrated his faith. And we've looked at other biblical examples and we saw that faith in biblical sense means that you act, you do something. And, you know, we are quick to point out that uh, doing things does not make us acceptable to God in the sense that we work out our salvation. But our purpose, once we have faith in God, is to demonstrate that faith in God by what we do. And I hope that's pretty clear um, to all of us. So then in chapter 3, he says, all of a sudden it seems like, my brethren, be not many masters or teachers. And so I want to tie some of that together. We know that uh, a teacher is someone who instructs, right? They provide uh, guidance on how we ought to do certain things. And obviously, we've, we've all been through school, and we understand that we have teachers in this subject and teachers in that subject. And the idea there is that they know more about that subject than we do, and they're supposed to impart their knowledge to us. And, and that's well and good. That's what's necessary. But what we see here is we see something that is a cautionary note. Now, we would not bring a, a, a you know, group of young children in here this morning and say, don't listen to what your teachers have to say, would we? We probably wouldn't do that. What would we say? We would say, you need to listen to your teachers because they know things more than you do, and if you listen to them, you're going to obtain the right kind of knowledge, right? That's what we would say. Well, he warns these that he's talking to, don't be many teachers or masters. Now, if you go back and look at the kind of people that he's dealing with here, back to chapter 1, what kind of people is he dealing with? He's dealing with people who hear the word of God, but what? Don't do it. Chapter 2, we're talking about people who claim to have faith, but their, their actions either deny it, or they don't have any actions that demonstrate their faith. Right? So in chapter 3 here, I think the continuation is, is pretty apparent that now he's talking to them about don't be many teachers. Have you ever had in your life, and I know you have, someone that seemed to know everything about anything and could always tell you what you should be doing? You ever known anybody like that? They were an expert on everything. And you sit here and you think back and say, there's no way someone could be an expert on everything. And after a while, you just get where it's like, I don't really want to talk to that person or be around that person. There's no way they can be an expert on everything. But there are people who are like that, who want to tell you what you should be doing all the time. Apparently, this is something that we're seeing here in James chapter 3. Here are people who say, I have faith, but I haven't demonstrated it. Here are people who are talking about how much faith they have, but they can't remember enough to, to recognize that they need to be about doing God's work. And so now it appears that these people have gotten to the point of where they are many teachers. They, they are telling you what to do about everything. Now, I don't know what, what generates a person with this mentality or mindset. But apparently, this is who he's writing to. Those, he says, you need to be careful not to be many teachers. Some of us may be good in one or two things. And we know how to do that really well. Because we've done it enough. And it's really not possible for someone to be an expert on everything. Now, 
Here's what he says to them. Be not many masters. Why? Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or a heavier judgment. What happens to someone who is a teacher? What obligation do they have? To teach what's correct, to impart knowledge. Now, if there's something you don't know about, and yet you try to talk about it, you might even be able to convince somebody you know what you're talking about. But now when you do that, then it's going to come back on you. Let's say, for example, someone who was um, teaching a course on um, EMT, emergency management, whatever. The people who do rescue. Let's suppose that there is a person who says, I know all about that. I know about all about emergency responses and how you ought to deal with people, how you ought to address wounds, what you ought to do if people are not breathing, uh, can't get a pulse, whatever. And so they come in and they say, I, I know all about that. And, and they start trying to teach somebody and they teach them totally wrong. They really don't know about all that. But for some reason, their ego or their pride or something says, I know all about that. So now they teach somebody how to do it wrong. And they go out and they try to administer uh, some kind of CPR or something to someone who is in need. And the person dies. <laughs> yeah, she, she knows all about birthing babies, and she talked all about it. And then when the time came for her to birth the baby, she said, I don't know nothing about birthing no babies, right? And, and that's, the way, that's the way apparently we see these people that he's talking to here. Don't be many masters. Don't be, be many teachers. You're going to receive a heavier judgment. Because when you say, I am a teacher... You have accepted the responsibility to pass on the appropriate knowledge. You see how dangerous that can be? Now here we're talking in a spiritual sense. Let's say that I'm going to be someone who sort of watches after you or sort of tries to teach you. And I don't have the proper foundation to do that in the, in the spiritual sense. What am I going to do? I'm going to send you in the wrong direction. And there are people who have stirred up and created such great discourse just in the body of Christ. I don't know if any of you know this or not. Uh, maybe you've had some insight to it. But there was a congregation here in this county that split a few years back over the topic or the issue of AD 70. Now, that may just be Greek to you. I don't know. I hope it's not. I hope you understand the teaching about AD 70. But that some people believe that that was the end of the, the world, as the Bible talks about it, the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, there were people who, who taught that, and, and then they would teach other people within their listening group about that and convince them that that was the truth and that the, the body of Christ at that location in general didn't understand it. And because of that, you know, they, they started holding this belief and there become a, a, a division in the church to the point that it split. Now, Their teaching on AD 70 is incorrect. Did that stop somebody from promoting that and pushing that? To the point that whoever would listen to that person caused division in the body of Christ? No, it didn't stop it. And God will take care of that. And I, you know, 
if he has mercy on the person that does that. But you understand what I'm saying? James is saying, you, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be a master, if you say you are going to teach somebody something, you're going to be held to a higher judgment. You better know what you're talking about. And apparently these people that he's cautioning might not have had that kind of background, the strong background they needed in what they were talking about. And he goes on to say, for in many things, we, we all offend. There are things that we, we do. We just do things. We say things. Sometimes we offend. Maybe we don't mean to. Uh, we try not to. But look at what he says here. If any man offend not in word, what kind of man is that? Perfect man. Could, could we have a sort of a separation here this morning? in the auditorium of those who are perfect versus those who are not perfect. I'd like to just, you know, get one to sit on one side of the auditorium and those on the other. If we ask everybody to move at this time, would we have any anybody in here that's perfect? I don't think so. So we're all going to offend in word, right? But the point is, you better be careful that you don't offend because you think you know something and you are in a, thinking you're in a position to impart something to somebody and you don't have that knowledge. And we know that or not, right? If I were a math teacher and I had to teach algebra or calculus, you think I'd know that before I got out in front of a group of kids? I think I'd know that, wouldn't I? I think I would know if I know it. But sometimes we convince ourselves we know things. We're willing to give out guidance or advice about some things maybe we don't know much about. And we need to be careful about that. Now, If I were to go ask somebody how to deal with kids, would I go to Jill of Jack and Jill, or would I go to the old woman who lived in the shoe? Somebody don't kill to have any kids. Say, so how do you how do you take care of these kids? How is it you can deal with them? They do this, they do that. How do you handle that? You don't go ask somebody who doesn't have any kids how to handle kids. We understand how obvious that is. But there are people sometimes who think they can impart some knowledge to us. And obviously we're, we're concerned here about spiritual things in James chapter 3. And so the whole idea is you better be well grounded in what you are teaching and know the material than to try to give somebody advice. Because you're going to be held in condemnation if you teach something that is not correct. And so that's a stern message that he starts out with. But remember the kind of people we're dealing with here. We're dealing with people who say, oh, I have faith. I, I, in other words, I know all there is to know about living a Christian life. And James asked the question, well, have you shown anybody your faith? And it seems like the deafening sound of the answer no is there. No, I mean, we, we, we just, we have it. You just need to believe that we have faith. James says, that's not good enough. You've got to demonstrate it. And so here he talks about people who claim again to have all this knowledge and know what they need to be doing, but aren't necessarily properly grounded in what they're going to teach. And he says, look, you're going to be condemned uh, if you try to be many masters or many teachers. And Everybody's going to offend in word, except if you're a perfect man, and we don't know but one of those. And so everybody is going to offend. He says the one that's perfect is able to bridle the whole body. That's the only way he could speak and not ever offend, is if he could control his whole body. Now, I want you to notice the contrast that's fixing to take place here. What's he talking about bridling here if he's a perfect man? No, no, look at it again. 
He's going to bribe the whole body. Now, here's the contrast. We have trouble bridling the smallest member of our body. Isn't that interesting? Perfect man can bridle his whole body. That would include the tongue, right? But there is a problem in trying to bridle just our tongues. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. We control their whole body. And he says also the ships, uh, which though they be so great and are driven uh, of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Have you ever been and seen any of these huge ships like these... Uh, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> the um, carrier cruises, the, whatever those ships are called. Have you ever seen what governs those? Have you ever seen the size compared to the whole ship? It's, it's unbelievable how small of a piece will change the directions of a ship. And they're very, very small. But they, they're, these huge ships can be moved around to go where they want them to go with something very, very small. And he, so he says here, even so the tongue's a little member. It's little, but causes a lot of problems. Now, equate that back to what he's talking about being teachers. What can you see here that apparently is a situation? There are people who are talking about that which they do not know. And if we teach something that we do not know of, what are we imparting? Certainly not knowledge. Error, confusion. And so he says here that if you're going to be a teacher, know what you're going to talk about and make sure that you teach properly. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boast is great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. The tongue. is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. There are so many things that the tongue can do that are positive. And you can talk about 10, 15, 20, 100 things that are positive and then what can you do one time with that tongue? You can tear it all down. You can tear it all down. And so he's saying to these Christians that are scattered, you need to be careful with what you are saying and what your tongue is doing. I mean, how many of us usually believe that everything we do is on a scale system and that if we do more good than we do bad, then that's, that's okay? Isn't that what we usually think? I'm a pretty good person. Don't we usually say that? I'm a pretty good person. I don't do a lot of bad things. That's why we try to sort of relate ourselves to what we ought to be doing, right? But there are times when that tongue can start lashing and it will destroy anything that has been built up. You don't believe that? Take a friendship that's been 20 years in the making. And now they don't talk to each other. What usually caused that? Was it something that um, happened to them that was catastrophic? Or was it just something that was a simple matter of someone couldn't control their tongue? Something that was said. You've hurt my feelings. You've, you've said something that you know, was totally wrong, out of place. 
and now our friendship is gone. Is that how it happens? I mean, it's usually not. It's not usually you shot my dog. It's not you kill one of my family members. There are people who don't talk to each other today because of something that was said. And so that tongue can be devastating. And it can light on fire anything. It can destroy families. It can destroy congregations. And so, as a Christian... What are you supposed to do with your tongue? Control it. Now the Bible says that no man can tame a tongue. Let's read on. For every kind of beast and of birds and serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, why is it that the tongue is untamed? Why is the tongue untamed? Could we, following after the teachings of Jesus, be very careful about what we say and implement good rules like counting to ten before you speak? And if there's some... uh, anger or something to go away and come back the next day, things of that nature, we could implement some of those things and we could do a lot better job of how we control our tongues. Right? There are things we can do to make it much better. And so I guess the point is here, we can do those things. What motivates us to do those things? If I'm a Christian, what motivates me to try to control my tongue. Okay, God's commands, if, they, if I take them, golden rule. If I'm going to, to listen to what God's Word has to teach and it's going to influence me, then it's got to be evident in how I conduct myself. And a big part of that is how I control my tongue. Okay? We're not there, but it's something that we continue to work on. And I guess the point I'm making here in verse 8 is it's the, the tongue can no man tame, but with God's help, we can certainly uh, make things a whole lot better, right? Um, I have seen people... Go from profanity to instant clean mouth, depending on who's in their presence. How can he do that? Is it just some kind of uh, uncontrollable reaction? That someone comes into the room or something and then all of a sudden, whoop, you know, switch switch my brain, you know. Now a different part of my brain takes over and and now I, I don't talk that way. How do they control that? Something that they that that happens involuntarily, or is it something that they have decided to do? Decided to do. How do you do that? You control it. So there are things that we can do that uh, that we we know control can take place if we are motivated by the proper things like wanting to serve God, wanting to, to obey His commandments, wanting to, t- to treat others the way they need to be treated, we can control that tongue, you know? Uh, not on our own, I don't believe. 
but with the help of God, I believe we can control the tongue. But it is something that has such devastating effects. It's like the, the thing that, that comes closest to me to understanding the, the devastation of the tongue is, a, is like having a, a dry forest and dropping one match in it. And then once that, that match has started that fire, oh, the problems that it causes. Every year in California, we see on the news, a wildfire is running rampant. You know, millions of acres are going to be destroyed because somebody was careless with a match or a cigarette or whatever. And so that's the kind of devastation the tongue can have. And so if I know that that's the kind of devastation the tongue could have, what kind of emphasis do I put on controlling that tongue as a Christian? I won't put a great little effort. I'm going to try to put that and keep that contained to where that doesn't get out and cause damage. If you have uh, ever had an old bull or if you have a, a mean dog, or been around one. If, if you don't want to terrorize the neighborhood, you're going to keep it locked up somewhere, right? Or put up. Because you know that can happen. You know the potential. And, and so you, we need to understand our tongues in that way. My tongue can get me in all kinds of trouble, so therefore I'm going to keep it locked up. I'm going to constrain it. Uh, in, in whatever ways that I can to keep from causing The results of it. Because look what he says in verse 8. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now what is deadly poison? If you think of poison, what do you normally think of? What's going to happen to you? You're going to die. What about deadly poison? You're going to die, die, die. I mean, he could have just told us, it's unruly and it it has it's poisonous. It can cause cause death. But he says it is deadly poison. You know, there are some things that you can touch to your tongue, and all it takes is just that right there, and you're dead. There are some some things that uh, come from some plants or from some animals that are poison. You can just touch them to the tip of your tongue. Just a, just a scarce amount of it, and you're dead within a matter of a few seconds. Now, that's scary, isn't it? Do you realize when you open your mouth with your tongue, the devastation you can cause? I mean, if you want to cause devastation, then you certainly can do it. But if you know that it's that dangerous then we need to know how to be able to cut it off, to be able to stop it. But look at what happens sometimes. And apparently, maybe this was something that they needed to hear. Verse 9, Therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after similitude of God, but because we're angry, we don't recognize that. We don't see that that's someone made in God's image. We look at it as somebody who has angered us. And so we're going to lash out and to curse them. And what does he say about these things? Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings, my brethren. These things ought not so to be. It should not happen that the Christian's tongue is not under some kind of control. And there are times, I know there are times when we get into a situation where we, we're just going to let it fly. And we've got to stop that. We've got to be able to be under control. There are times within the body of Christ where we could, we could pour water on a situation and make it go away. And instead we, we're sitting there with that tongue. And we're fixing to light it up. 
because we are going to get our say-so in. We can't have those kind of attitudes as Christians. Doth a fountain send forth at the same time, same place, sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, if you look at what we've been talking about here, what were we talking about in chapter 2? What kind of faith? A, a talking faith? A faith that is demonstrated by just how much I talk about it? A faith that is shown by actions. And here we're talking about tongues and how the tongue can be such a devastating thing and how we ought to be careful about how we use it and how we misuse it in our lives. We think sometimes that it's okay on one occasion to, to be very controlled with our tongue and then on another occasion it's okay, I can just say whatever I want to here. Apparently this is what the, the, James is writing to him about. There are occasions when you think, okay, I, I can say things that are spiritual and I can talk about my faith and things of that. And then on the, other, on the other hand, there are things when something comes up, I can just let my tongue just lash out. That's what they thought. But look at what he says here in verse 13 all of a sudden. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or the way he lives his life his works with meekness of wisdom. What place does that have here in the middle of talking about the tongue? What kind of spirit is a Christian supposed to have? A haughty spirit? Or a humble spirit? Humble spirit. We know that. And if I'm going to speak things, I need to speak things that are fully backed up with knowledge. And I need to apply those things in wisdom. So we're still talking about the tongue here. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? What do we start out with in verse 1? Be careful about being many teachers. And so he asks the question here in the middle of the, or toward the end of chapter 3, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Are you someone who thinks that they can be a teacher? Are you someone who says that I have the, the whereabouts to be your teacher, to tell you how to live your life? He said, if that's the case, let him show out of a good conversation or a good life his works with meekness of wisdom. What is going to bear out about a teacher over time? Whether, whether or not they know what they're talking about or not. And what typically is evidenced about a teacher happens after their students are gone to the next level. If I go to the next level and my teacher was well, well knowledgeable about that subject and knew how to apply that knowledge in such a way that I could pull it in and I could understand it and I could apply it, when I get to the next level, I don't have any problems. Oh, yeah, I remember going over this. I know exactly how to do this. This is not hard for me. But I'm telling you, within my own family, and I know you've probably seen it before, I've had kids who've had poor teachers on occasion, and when they got to the next level, they were lost. Because the teacher could not convey what they knew to the student. And so he says, if you're going to be wise, if you're going to be someone who is what they need to be, you be able to impart that wisdom with meekness. 
We'll pick up here next, uh, next week and try to wrap up chapter 3 and get on into chapter 4. But hopefully this has been um, beneficial to us this morning. Thank you.